You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Kelsey Ray Dimper. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Business Essentials for Authors is your Business 101 guide for the publishing industry. Whether you've never published at all or are looking to take your professional career up a notch in an easy-to-read and conversational way, the book covers the five pillars of business. We look at all of this and more from a long-term strategic view. How to get the plan done and the mindset to make it all work. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to 4, that's the number 4, thewords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the the seat-in-the-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off 
a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Kelsey Ray Denberg on the show with me. She has a phenomenal new book called Girl in the Rearview Mirror. And uh, this is uh, you know, one of those books that got my blood pressure up and kept it up for about a week as I was reading it. I think you guys are really going to love it. Uh, welcome to the show, Kelsey. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to have you. Uh, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Mm, I love that question. I wanted to be a writer very young, like I think a lot of writers did. I loved reading growing up. I was, even before I actually could read, I was fascinated by reading and and pretended that I could read. Um, So that is really when, I mean, I have stories stapled together from when I was like four and five you know, just a couple of words on a page and maybe a a drawing of a castle or a horse. Um, So I pretty much have always wanted to be a writer. I love that. Uh, Were you a big reader as a kid? Yes. What What were some of the books or series that really grabbed your imagination? Um, so I loved the golden compass series by Philip Pullman. He's also got an excellent um, sort of like a Victorian mystery series, the Sally Lockhart series that I was obsessed with. I actually still have my original versions of all those books and they're like completely disintegrating um, spine left. Um, So I know I loved those. I loved like the, the Redwall books. I remember loving E.B. White. Um, When I was a little younger, I loved the Ramona uh, Quimby, I think her last books. Um, And then really young, I I loved picture books. um, Like the ones I remember are the the major classics like Eloise and, um, you know, like the Hungry Caterpillar, ones that actually are still read today that I read with my nieces and nephews. I, um, I, I know that uh, Philip Pullman series that you're talking about, the Victorian mystery series. And I was, I was wondering where that love of mystery uh, came into your, to your early reading. Uh, you can definitely trace back that there's a, an early love of, of this kind of, uh, of story. Uh, do, do you remember when you first started falling in love with, with mysteries and the, uh, you know, the stories that, that made you think and kept you guessing. Ooh, so I was a pretty um, omnivorous reader. And I would say I still am. I, I don't only read uh, mysteries and crime, though I certainly read a lot of them. Um, yeah. But I do remember reading mysteries growing up. Um, and I remember reading like the Nancy Drew. And in high school, I, I had a big... Thing with John Grisham, um, just sort of devouring these these stories and, and Stephen King um, books. So I think, I guess I would say now that I'm saying these titles out loud, the trend was really these really thick brick-like books that would just transport you on this really complex story that you just get completely sucked in and forget to kind of eat and, and sleep and that kind of thing. Um, did you ever think of pursuing, uh, another career? I know that you, uh, you got an MFA and, uh, so your, your college trajectory, uh, was, was kind of sending you down this line, but were there ever any other thoughts of career paths or, or things that you wanted to pursue? For sure. Um, actually I would say I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was very little, so like elementary school, um, maybe even into middle school. But in high school, I don't actually remember doing much writing myself. Um, probably my favorite class or subject in high school was math. Um, 
and I loved Spanish class too. And I actually had no idea what I wanted to do. Like in high school and early college, I would have said maybe be a lawyer because that was sort of like the default thing that people who liked to read and write sort of did or were told they should do. Um, but I also really liked liked math. So actually when I started college, I started in a business um, in the business major and I was taking like um, economics and accounting. Um, and I just, I think I just was very practical and thought this is, you know, what I quote should be doing. Um, and I think I might've looked into engineering had I had any ability to, um, do like physics. Like my brain does not love picturing things in 3D. And I felt like that was sort of what prevented me from going down that path because I just, that was just a stumbling block for me. I, I don't have a very intuitive um, depth perception, I guess. Um, my brother is an engineer and he's very good at all that. Um, so anyway, I was in college, I was in business, studying t- to be a business major. And I was also taking a lot of languages. I studied um, Spanish and Mandarin and um, Portuguese in college. And so I had no clue, as you can probably tell. I was into my sophomore year, and I was like, I have no idea where this is headed. Um, And then I took a creative writing class uh, for fun. Uh, The teacher was T.M. McNally. And he was just one of those teachers that has all those little, like, chestnuts of wisdom. And he had this wonderful storytelling voice. And he just made the class so, so wonderful that I decided I should keep taking writing classes um, for the rest of of college. And I did. Um, And I ended up switching my major to English literature because my practical side was still dominating it was I can't, I can't be creative writing I have to be I have to be something more serious um, but then in my senior year of college I won a big writing award um, called the Swarthout Award for a short story I wrote and that I think really made me think okay this is a thing that I could do it's It's not just um, a fantasy. Um, And it was around 2008, so the economy was not very good. I definitely did not want to graduate and have to, like, find a job. That was not at the top of my list of things to do. Um, So I applied for into MFA programs. Um, And then my backup plan was that I was going to maybe try to go to grad school and study language. So I did get into an MFA program in San Francisco and I was, and then that's just sort of what I did. That was sort of determined my fate, I guess. Um, The MFA programs, uh, you know, uh, people tend to come down on on one or of two sides. They either absolutely love it and feel like that the MFA took them to another level and gave them tools that they might not have acquired anywhere else, or some people are just kind of meh uh, on it. Uh, Can you point to anything specifically that you took away from the MFA program um, that you feel like made you a better writer? Definitely. Um, So like I said, I was a pretty new writer when I started. And so the number one benefit I got from the MFA was having readers consistently reading and critiquing my work. And this sounds very, very basic, but I think when I was starting out in writing, especially, I would just sort of go wild with these sort of flights of, of prose. And um, I didn't always remember that someone would actually read every single word and, you know, I might leave something in because it sounded good, even if it made absolutely no sense. And I think that having somebody, a reader really anchored me and reminded me 
that I had to actually tell a story and I had to make the characters make sense for an audience. Um, and it's like a very basic, um, sort of a basic benefit, I guess, but, but that was huge to have an audience just automatically raises, I think your writing level. Um, also having an audience makes you feel very validated. Like, Oh, I'm, I am a writer, you know, people are going to read my work and talk about it. Um, and I think that especially in the years after my MFA, I feel like that sort of kept me going because um, I think I might have felt like a little bit of a fraud or like I was just doing it for a hobby and that it could never be serious if I hadn't had that sort of community that was taking me seriously as a writer. After the MFA, you went to, to work, uh, as a writer, but not writing fiction, uh, right away. What, what were some of the, the, uh, the jobs that you took? Yeah. So my very first job was at Groupon in Chicago. Um, so this was fresh out of my MFA, 2011. Um, and Groupon was very, um, it was really blowing up right around that time. So um, it was being featured in the New York Times, and it was this really sort of hot company in Chicago. So I, I moved there to work at Groupon, um, and I loved it. It was so much fun. It was like my job is to write zany Internet coupons. Um, it was very weird and bizarre. Like we would have meetings where we would talk about cat jokes and things like that. And it was just, um, a very interesting place to work. Um, and there were a lot of other creatives working there, um, writers, but also, uh, musicians and playwrights and actors and a lot of improv comedians. Um, so it was a really fun place to work. I think especially for for me, because I knew I wanted to be a writer too. So it was sort of exciting to be with other people who had a day job, but were also um, sort of actively trying to make their art happen. Um, So that was a a great job. Um, I was a writer at first, and then I eventually became a deputy managing editor there. So I had like managed a team and it was sort of a really grown up um, kind of job. And that was a really great experience for me because I did I still didn't know if I would be able to be like a novelist. Um, so I think if I hadn't become a novelist, I probably would still be sort of in this corporate or editorial writing world doing that work. What's really interesting is a lot of people talk about those uh, early jobs working in writing, um, but not writing for yourself. And a lot of those jobs can be really soul sucking and, and crushing, you know, to show up to. But it sounds like you had a really great experience and that it was a, an atmosphere that fostered creativity. That, that, that is a, uh, uh, that is a, a blessing to use a word that's overused, but, uh, you know, not everybody gets, uh, to be in a place like that. Yeah. Well, you know, it was still a job, you know, sure. I had to, I, I know far too much about like laser hair removal. <laughs> <laughs> when you're writing about like your 75th Italian restaurant, you know, yeah, it is for sure work. Um, but that almost was helpful too. Um, I think when I was in my MFA program, I considered writing to be sort of this precious, um, like, Oh, I need to be inspired. I need a whole day clear in order to channel my creativity. And I think, when you get a job as a writer professionally, those quickly go out the window and you really have to do it. Um, So that was really helpful. That's like some sense to me. So what was the, the call and the draw back to fiction writing? When did, uh, and when did this book girl in the rear view mirror mirror, uh, when did that story start to take form for you? Um, so I was, I actually started the book in grad school 
and I had been working on a different novel. I, I wrote a whole other novel first, and it was a um, very different book. It was a literary coming-of-age story um, that had grown out of a short story that I wrote, um, and it was terrible. It was it was very moody, and it was very um, just... I always felt like very trapped in it and and like I was sucked in by this character's inertia. Um, so I was, I handed it in um, to my thesis instructor after the first like year of working on the thesis. And then I took a break from it. And around the same time I had started getting really interested in film noir. Um, I happened to have gone to a, to a noir fest um, noir film festival at the Castro theater in San Francisco. And they, they played these, these real old noirs and I just fell in love with them. They were so stylish and I really loved the sort of intensity of the action and, um, in the characters sort of desires in the drama. And I thought to myself, this is about as opposite as my my book could be. So I'm going to write a noir, like just for fun, just to take a break. Um, and so then I started writing Girl in the Rearview Mirror. Um, and it ended up just taking over. I just, I loved it. I had so much fun. The characters came alive. The setting came to life. It was as if by switching into this genre, I was able to sort of find my storytelling voice that I had struggled to to find in my in my other book. And so I ended up writing a full draft of it um, in school and submitting that as my thesis. And I was very, very enthusiastic about it. And then I started work and I fell completely off the wagon. <laughs> <laughs> Because I moved across the country, I got married, I got an adorable puppy, um, I was meeting all these exciting new people and artists, and so I was very swept up in in sort of life, and I realized that I could literally never write another word of my book and still be perfectly busy. Um, so it took me probably at least a year um, out of grad school and working before I seriously got to writing again and, and started working up the discipline to keep, to write regularly. There's a, there's something really, um, I, I don't know that you, you talked about that first book that you wrote and how it, it almost became, um, you know, a chore and it, it was, it was kind of, uh, larger than you and, and kind of became this other thing. Um, but when you talk about writing this book, that it, the fun was there, that the passion was there. Um, and, and I know that, that writing can't be, you know, every time you sit down, um, you can't hold it too precious like you were talking about earlier and that there is work that goes into it. But but there is something about a project that you feel passionately about that does kind of help you through those those dark times and the struggles and and, and all of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, of course, you know, you're not always like delighted um, to sit down. And, but there has to be something about the book that is fundamentally sort of magical to you that sort of gets you through those times when it's feels a little more like drudgery, like, oh, my God, I have to revise this scene again. Um and yeah, I think that that sometimes if you're feeling like the words are are sort of dead on the page, or if you don't care what happens to the characters, I mean, those are pretty bad signs. It's really difficult to keep to expect a reader to care if you don't. Right. When you first start uh, envisioning a story, when when the when the beginnings of the story start to come alive. Um, what usually starts with you? Is it a setting? Is it a character? Uh, is it a premise? Uh, how does a story usually start forming? Good question. Um, 
So as I was saying, I think especially with Girl in the Rearview Mirror, because of the situation I was in, that book really started with the idea of of making a genre story and of the mystery. So I'd say that one started a little bit more with the plot. Um, and I guess I would say in general what what comes to me is more like a, a mysterious circumstance or like a, an image of a scene and I don't exactly know what's happening. So for Girl in the Rear View, that was Amabel, the four-year-old um, girl that Finn nannies in the book. Amabel comes to Finn and says that a woman is following her and sort of where is that going to go and why would a, would a woman be following a little girl? Um, that was really what what launched that book for me. Um, so sometimes just this this character who's in an unusual situation um, is kind of what starts it. Um, but the setting was also was also a very important um, inspiration for me with Girl in the Rearview Mirror. Um, having that Phoenix setting um, really, really helped me understand the mood of the book. Um, and some of the imagery throughout the book. And so that was a pretty crucial early inspiration. What is it about Phoenix specifically, uh, do you think, gives you that, uh, uh, the setting that's ripe for a story like this? Oh, so I lived in Phoenix. I went to college in Phoenix um, before I moved to San Francisco. Um, and my family had lived there when I was young. My little sister was born there. Um, and I went to like grade school in Phoenix. Um, so it's a very special um, place. I mean, for one, it just has a very, very stark um, landscape and climate um, that I felt like lent itself to noir really well. Um, when I was writing the book, it sort of felt to me like, you know, the character is just under this broiler you know, like with the sun just bearing down because it's summer in Phoenix, it's like 118 degrees and and it's um, just really extreme. And some of the imagery of like long shadows and, and these sort of stark, um, dry landscapes were really vivid to me. Um, I also think Phoenix has a very classic, like, you know, Noir often covers these sort of class discrepancies, and I think Phoenix is where you can go to the wealthier suburbs, like north of the city, and they're, you know, what you picture. There's palm trees, and there's swimming pools, and it's this very manicured version of the desert. Um, And then you can go to these small towns, like in the south of the city especially, and they're just, you know, they're just sort of baked dry and they're just a much it's a totally different world um and i really wanted to capture that within the book the the book is full of uh twists and turns and when you think that you uh have the story figured out um you take us in a completely different direction and i absolutely love that um but when when writing are you are you a planner uh or are you, you know, uh, what we call a pantser? Um, how how do you envision the story? Do you know where it's going from the beginning? Or are you discovering as you write? I am a pantser who has a deep guilt about it and wishes they were a plotter or a planner. Uh, <laughs> I will do like these outlines. Like I'm, you know, doing my homework, like I got to organize this. And then when I'm actually writing it, I just, you know, I just really sort of go off, um, off the plan completely. So what I have tried to do is to have a couple of, a couple of things I know about the book to at least guide me in. So like I said, I knew that this little girl is coming to her nanny with a question And then in advance of writing, I sort of had an idea of who the family was and and a little bit about what their secret was. And then I just started writing um, 
so I didn't really plan for for a lot of those twists to happen. Um, I didn't know what was going to happen um, to the family. I didn't know um, I didn't know the ending. So all of those things sort of came out in the writing. And actually most of the really major twists came out in that very first draft. Um, and then I, then I was like, oh, okay, that's, what's, that's what is going to happen. So then you sort of go back. And once you've been through the first draft, you sort of almost have to become a little bit more of a planner because you, you know, you sort of know. So then going back through and, and getting more organized and trying to understand your characters better in light of the events and um, sharpening like the setting and and the pacing and all that is much more organized after after that sort of first imagining of, of the story. What uh, what surprised you the most uh, in writing it? And, and I don't mean specific plot points, but were you take as as a writer, were you taken by surprise uh, as the story unfolded for you? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this. <laughs> I know I, I realized as I asked that, I said, well, maybe that's not such a good, but yeah. yeah. Um, I would say the ending was definitely a surprise to me and I actually um I still find it to be pretty devastating um you know when I would work on it I you know it would always sort of land so I think that that surprised me like oh this is this is the sort of tone and yeah so that was that was a surprise and I think then you sort of try to try to make sure that it's not just a surprise as in like where did that come from? And more of a, like, oh, wow. Like more of a sense of surprise, but rightness as opposed to just randomness. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, The Girl in the Rearview Mirror is out everywhere now. It's been out for a couple of days when you're hearing this. Um, This is a fantastic read that will keep you turning pages from page one all the way through. Um, Kelsey, if people are just learning about you and uh, discovering your work, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Definitely. I'm on all the social media. So I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And my handle is K Ray, R A E Dimberg. Um, And you can also visit me at Kelsey Ray Dimberg.com. And I try to keep that pretty updated with um, press mentions, with interviews, with um, with some events that I'm doing. So I would love it if you just w- want to drop me a line. Um, you can also email me through my website or, again, any of those social media. It would be fun to connect. Absolutely. Um, what are you working on now, Kelsey? I know this book has been um, a while in the making. Having it out there to the world is a is a great mm-hmm. feeling, I know. But uh, what do you follow that up with next? I'm working on my next novel, and it is not a thin novel, so it's a totally different story. Um, and it is set in San Francisco, and it features a, a sort of exciting, rapidly growing uh, beauty and wellness startup and a mystery within. Oh, nice. That's going to be amazing. Uh, Kelsey, we look forward to seeing what comes up next, and congratulations on the book launch. Uh, I know this is going to be a phenomenal year for you. Um, When the new book comes out, please come back and, and chat with us about it. Thank you. I would love to. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to HankGarner.com to find all of the archives of the show, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. I'm melting! I'm melting! cried Joey. Take the picture already! He stood with one arm around the bronze waist of the bewitched tribute statue, Samantha Stevens, riding a broom across a crescent moon. Jason tried in vain to frame the shot without any tourists in it, but that was impossible. From all points of the compass, a merry horde had arrived for Salem's two-day summer psychic fair. 
All the commuter trains had burst open, like cornucopias filled beyond capacity, spilling endless fruits and nuts onto the red brick sidewalks of Essex Street. A vampiress in lavender shorts and feathered boots sold maple chocolate walnut fudge in front of the Witch City Tattoo Parlor. A near-naked gypsy in purple-green veils danced with a pheasant in her arms around a plug-in Hanukkah menorah. A fat man in a fetching blue jeans dress sold amethyst and citrine charm bracelets in front of Medusa Cafe, but his stand got knocked over by a one-armed crone driving a mobility scooter who sang, Choo-choo! as she passed, her stump on the wheel, her lipstick ghastly, her gnarled right hand raised in trailing plumes of noxious cigarette smoke. Chewbacca leapt out of her way and slapped sparks from his fur. He gave a disgruntled growl before going back to playing summer lovin' on his ukulele. The old one-armed dervish drove off, choo-choo, parting a crowd of wanderers, slack-jawed tourists with camera straps tight across their bellies, yellow-vested police on segways, elderly rollerbladers, face-painted infants and harried parents, and college girls. So many hot, hysterical college girls that you'd think somebody had napalmed a sorority house. Jason, are you deaf? Sorry. Jason raised the phone and took the shot. Joey inspected the photo and nodded in approval. Your turn. No, thanks. Do it, Shaggy. Don't make me hex you. Jason gave in and traded places. He put an arm around Samantha's metal back. Her bronze body had flushed in the afternoon sun, warm through his glove, but her eyes were weary. No, downright creepy and her smile was forced, like a Disneyland princess who'd had her toe stomped. Say chowder, cried Joey, who'd been practicing his New England accent all morning. Come on, man, say chowder. Fine, chowder. Joey got the shot, and Jason surrendered Samantha to a chubby kid wearing a Gandalf beard who climbed up to worship her bronze bosom.